The group squat, huddled together in the footwells and rear seats of the car. The sacrificial girl takes this opportunity. She leaps up and pulls at the door handle. Musso manages to grip her arm. The girl screams at him, clawing at his hand. The others try to subdue the youngster, only for the girl to pull herself free of the lard he slips out of the door and makes for the forest, running with abandon, the crown slipping from her head. Malaika pushes the door open fully, then rushes after her, shouting, crying out to the youngster. Ezra sees this and tries to get out of the car. His friends tell him not to bother. She's going back to the village. Drive! Drive! Shouts Musso. Ezra starts the engine and accelerates away. Runs into the village of the witch. He pants, bending over, hands on his knees, trying to regain his breath. A mouthful of phlegm is spat onto the ground. He lifts his rifle and fires a shot into the air. The witch moves slowly from her perch, withered legs carrying her to the clearing. Eyes cast downward, she kneels before the man. From her pocket comes an assortment of leaves. They're taken in hand and shaken. A few words are spoken, then she throws them down on the dirt. She giggles, the laughter rippling through the jungle. As he approaches, the remaining villagers make a defensive circle around her. The old man pulls the rifle up to his shoulder and unleashes a stream of lead into the air. He tries to look menacing, the po so he lowers the rifle's barrel, aiming it at the crowd, then pulls the trigger. Fire spits from the end of the barrel. Branches and leaves scratch at Malaika's body as she tears through the jungle, her quarry only a few meters ahead. She is a young woman in the prime of her life. She gains on the youngster quickly, tackling her at the knees, forcing the girl to the ground. Arms wrapped up, she's quickly subdued, wrestled into submission. Her heartbeat can be felt pumping in her chest. Breath rushes in and out of the girl, whistling past her lips. Slowly she calms. Malika smiles. The girl has stopped tensing her muscles. She grips at her body instead, holding her in an unyielding and The birds start to sing overhead, no longer scared by these scrapping humans. The bird song and whining of the tree limbs pervade the forest. All else is quiet and still, as the forest should be. Malika rises, pulling the youngster up with her. I will help you. Understand? She whispers. The girl looks up at her, eyes as if searching them for meaning. A bird sings up in a nearby tree. Malika looks up, hoping to spot the animal. She doesn't see the sudden movement that the girl makes. The virgin swings her arm at Malika. She holds a flat stone in her palm. It meets her victim's head with a sickening knock. A lump of hairy flesh falls to the grass, again beating it with no remorse. Her body slumps forwards limp, moving only when struck. The young girl stops the attack and peers down. Malika doesn't move, only her eyelids flicker. No emotion registers on the youngster's face, just a look of disbelief. Then she flings the stained rock away. She gets round and runs off into the thicket. Ezra's car rolls into the witch's village. Inside it, the men chatter like monkeys. The tank is empty. They were lucky, freewheeling the last few hundred meters to the village. They continue to walk until Ezra recognizes that there aren't any people in the village. Where'd they all go? The men search the place checking inside the huts. There are fires and smoke. Animals run wild, but no humans. In a large hut, Ezra spots a stone carving of some fearsome-looking creature. He picks it up and flips it over in his hands. Heavy for such a small piece of stone. Dark like the sky at night, sparkling with luminous minerals. 
he feels faint with it in his hands. Jesus, this thing is freaky. The carving reminds him of a film from his childhood. He can't remember which film it was, or when he saw it, but it was strangely similar. Like a half-man, half-reptile, mixed with God knows what. Jaws wide, teeth sharp, spikes protruding from its face and neck. The eyes leer up at the little accountant. They sparkle, shimmering like... Oh shit! shouts Kay. Ezra looks up to shock. They stand over near the village's centre. Something attracts their attention. The little man places the idol back where he found it. A weight seems to be removed from his shoulders as he does. Upon approaching the guards, he forgets all about the statue. It takes him a few seconds to compute what he's seeing. Limbs and skin and clothes all mixed up, spattered with blood. Oh my good God, have mercy on their souls. He his chest and looks up into the sky as he says the words. Kay spits, trying to remove the bad taste from his mouth. They turn away from the sight, sickness climbing up into their bellies. Bodies lie in the dirt, riddled with holes, their flesh already starting to turn a putrid grey. Only minutes before they had been full of life, now the inner light has dimmed, the eyes stare, mouths hang open. They have lost something. Ezra could tell that they were no longer living, and not just because they had holes punched through their bodies. Somehow, in a strange way, they had become inanimate, like a rock or some piece of trash. They were colourless, featureless. No sign of the old lady, Musso states. They turn away from the scene of the massacre, Ezra with a hand over his mouth. The men start to walk around, checking in the rest of the huts for any trace of the woman. A cigarette from his carton and lights it. As he takes a pull on it, something appears from the forest. It's the virginal girl, her pretty clothes now stained and torn. She looks around the village, searching, surveying. Then she darts off, with no reaction to the lack of villagers, or to the mound of mangled people. I see her! She's over there! Kay shouts to the others. From the area behind her, a roar erupts from the jungle. The little girl stops, stunned by its volume. She covers her ears until it ceases, running straight towards the emanation. The men just manage to spot the girl as she disappears between two huge leaves. Musso and Kay rush off after her. Ezra follows behind, but he halts momentarily. Malika, he mouths. The little man turns to face the vast jungle. With little thought, he departs, his friends heading in the opposite direction. The old man stumbles through the forest, dragging the old priestess with him. He musting intermittently. Branches and creepers fall as he swings his machete. Above him the sky begins to darken. Insects chirp and hum. Birds call incessantly. A murmuring can be heard in the thicket that surrounds him. Then his rifle pierces the air with a short burst of fire, its noise ringing in the ears of all that hear it. Birds cry in dismay, taking to the air. He trots on, moving faster now, pulling the ragged priestess behind him for her eyes which forces her to stumble and fall. In the twilight they coast along the edge of a narrow river bed. What was once a great river is now a brook at best. Smooth stones and mud fill the gully. A sliver of water runs through it and up into the hills beyond. The couple move on through the crevasse cut into the hillside by the once great river. Fat man tugs at the old woman's arm. She seems to be tiring. Feet scrape along the ground. He pulls at her hard, just as a roar from some grand throat rips through the area. A low hooting like that of a hyena laughing follows. Then the same roar erupts with greater volume. Ezra, 
or a bruised and sweaty facsimile of, rushes through the greenery of the jungle. He scans the area. Nothing can be seen, no sign of his compadre. It's getting dark here under the canopy. The insects are starting to swarm, making the air thick, almost viscous. He jogs further into the depths of the wild, calling for Malaika now. Still nothing. Standing alone, twisting back and forth, he searches in vain for his friend. Was she even a friend? He takes a long little heart. He finds a log to sit on. The man is tiring quickly, his body not used to such exertion. An image of her face emerges in his mind. In the sky over his head the moon rests. He sees it and smiles. A silent prayer moves his lips. An ode to his Lord, God. Repeating it again and again, until a mosquito bites it. He slaps it and winces as he rises from the log. The leaf litter sticks to his calf. It attaches itself to his back too. So the man pats himself down and pulls the strangely sticky leaves from behind his back. Then he feels their moisture. On his fingers he sees it now. Almost black in the poor light. It's blood. There's blood on the leaves. His mind races. Ezra, now energized, tracks the blood. He shouts for Malaika, screams even, but the blood stops. He cannot see any more. Malaika! Malaika! He lets out a huge call for the girl. Nothing. Shoulders slouch. Head hangs in discontent. He mutters to himself, chastising his abilities deriding his faith in its lies. Then he cocks his head. There's a rustling. Hello? Says the little man. Then he sees her, climbing from the bushes towards him, hands crossed over her chest, eyes staring vacantly. The man runs at her, gripping her frantically. Then he lets her go just as quickly. I'm, I'm sorry, are you hurt? The girl doesn't reply. Her eyes fall on him and she smiles, a grin, a sign of relief. Ezra returns the smile and leads her away, holding her hand with all the strength he dares use. Smoke curls around vines. The acrid tobacco smoke, sharp and unnatural in this green and fresh land. The old man's pipe flares, sending more fumes circling upwards. He sits on a mound, a pile of stones, that makes up a part of a greater ruin. Each stone had been placed with caring hands, each pile celebrated the life of an exceptional human. There are hundreds of them, smaller piles surrounding the larger, grander monuments. On the floor near the old man kneels the priestess, still blinded by his torn shirt sleeve. The air is filled with hooting and guttural chants. Howler monkeys couldn't... The forest is alive and vibrating. The fat man takes his pipe from his lips and coughs violently. His throat is expunged of all its disgusting effluence, which is spat out onto the stones at his feet. He throws the pipe down, a look of disgust on his face. The man's rifle is brought up ready. He peers down the sights, into the gloom. And eyes stare back at him from the forest's edge. Re moving but never blinking, never flinching. He slips from the stones and pulls the blind from his captive's eyes. Then he steps over to his rucksack and rummages through it. The woman blinks pleasantly, trying to regain some vision. Still on her knees, she looks out at the world noticing instantly that she was much higher up now, somewhere near the river's source. She spins around to see the boy of returned sight is short-lived. Lines after line of stacked rocks surround her, row after row of her dead ancestors lay at rest. The woman fumbles in her pockets, pulling seeds, leaves and miscellaneous junk from within. She hurls them down to the soil. A whimper emanates from the woman. 
like a scolded puppy and reveals his thoughts. He stares back at the woman with a cruel looking serrated knife in his hand. Screams, howling, enraged cries erupt from the forest. The creatures that stalk them, barely visible in the dark, have moved to surround the site. A wide expanse of them prowl at the ruin's edge, but they do not enter. Bodies twitch and contort maniacally. Eyes watch with intent. You want your will? What do you say, fellas? The howling creatures bray and gnash at the air. One of these former humans hurls a stone at the odd couple. The crowd cheer in their own way, howling and yelping. Trees tremble and buckle under their weight. More rocks are slung, sticks and baked mud too. They pepper the ground around the elsters. This takes the smile from the old man's face. Fear flickers across his visage. In front of him a gap is made in the ranks of the howling raises an octave. From the gloom wanders the virginal girl. She stands alone in the clearing, crying, trembling. A rock whips past her cheek. The girl flinches and screams. Daughter! My daughter! Come! The witch woman lurches forwards. She runs towards the forest only to trip and fall. Old man grips her by the ankle and pulls her back to his... If anyone's gonna have you, missus, it's gonna be me. Another rock flies at the girl, clipping her in the temple. She buckles but doesn't cry out. Her body goes limp. More pieces of stone streak past, inches from her bulbous head. You must help her. Use your weapon. The priestess begs. The man uses his weapon. He cracks it against the side. Quiet. Hold your tongue, woman. She whimpers at these words. Old man strides forwards, stepping over the woman. He raises the rifle sight to his eye. Stones continue to pummel the girl. The man flexes his finger. He settles his arm and releases four short bursts of fire. The ground around the girl erupts. Humans can't move faster than bullets. Carcasses. Limbs flail and claw at the air, then fall to the ground. Which woman has her nose to the soil? She feels at the floor and investigates her pockets. Items fill her hands again. She speaks quietly, staring at the back of the old man's head. Then the random selection of junk is thrown down. A feather, some red, long dry pieces of reed, and a small shard of clear glass. They make the shape of an archway on the ground. Again the woman speaks. If it must be this way. She picks up the glass, rising to her feet silently. The man is only a few steps away. He suspects nothing as she creeps towards him. The shard of glass held, then it slammed down hard into his shoulder. He spins around, firing lead into the soil. An arm reaches out to search for the thing buried in his back. It lies just out of his reach. He spins around the other way, this time reaching out with his right arm. The glass is dislodged. He hurls it into the undergrowth. Fucking shit! You shit, bitch! What the fuck?! She had slipped past him while the man was pouring at his back for the forest, grabbing the young villager. Blood spills from her mouth, teeth too. There's no life left in the tiny body. The waiting undead approach with caution. Many of them were the witch's subjects not two hours before. Leaving her daughter's wasted body, she steps over to the crowd of chattering creatures, eyes filled with rage. She leers at them. What then? She pulls her hair as she shouts. You've never answered me before. Do I take the slaying of my daughter as a threat? Tell me. Tell me, you beasts. From the darkness comes a large stone. It barrels into her shins, knocking the woman down with ease. The throng envelop her, dragging the old woman to the forest. 
She screams and fights, thrashing about like a fish on dry land. One of the undead throws out its arm, punching her skull, rendering the woman insensible. The screaming stop chatter of the undead can be heard. In the background, the white shirt of the old man can be seen, dappled with red. He sits, slumped on a pile of stones, watching passively as his prize disappears. Where then? I have an idea, you say no. So you tell me, where do we go? Muso and Kofwimbi guns slung across their backs. The hooting and screeching of the undead can be heard in the background, babbling in the dense greenery. We don't know where Ezra is, or that girl, we've got no car. What the fuck are we going to do? You know, with a bloody glove and fingerprint, you still wouldn't have a clue. Kay sucks his teeth in a derisory manner. Musso, you're a whining man, like a lady. I had a few girls... Fuck you, Kay! Musso yells back. You saw those crazy things. What, what was that? They see movement ahead. Both men fumble for their rifles. Neither of them are quick enough to draw before Ezra and Malaika run into view. My friends! Musso shouts. How did you find us? We followed the blood and destroyed forest, man. And uh, one of you was shouting in this really whiny high-pitched voice. Ezra says, Quimby laughs. Muso grabs the latecomers and forces them back towards the witch's village. We don't know what to do. Those crazies are back there. We got the fuck away. It's like a nightmare. They got the little girl. I hope she's okay. Muso chatters. They got her. Ezra asks, stupefied. He looks at Malaika with sorrow in his eyes. She knows this look too well. In her native tongue, she asks. Shall I tell her? Kay asks. You better. I don't want to lie. Ezra replies. He tells her what they saw. The girl running into the forest. The strange deformed humans surrounding her. She was gone. Taken. Malaika stops walking. She turns back to face the forest. The men stop too. They hear her words, but only Kay understands. She was our only hope. Kay's face wrinkles with ignorance. He understands, but does not comprehend her words. The other two look on, unknowing. The girl speaks again. Those things are the wrath of our gods. When the sun and the moon both shine, the gods are watching, judging, to make we have to kill an innocent. The land must taste blood. That is what the teachings say. Kay looks shocked by this statement. Speech fails him. What? What did she say, Kay? Ezra asks. She says we have to kill a virgin to stop those fuckers. Kay shouts. Muso and Ezra react similarly, although the look of fear on Ezra's face is right. He shifts his weight from foot to foot. His stupor is short-lived, however. An animalistic howl shatters the silence. They all flinch at the sound. Muso pulls at Malaika's arm, leading her toward the deserted village once again. The manager sits on the front edge of his desk, a sports jacket flung over his shoulder. The lights in the office are off. Only his desk lamp brightens the room. A few bars of some classical tune. Then the phone rings out. He hurries to pick it up. Hi, the bureaucrat says, lifting the handset quickly. I... I... Yes, sir. I'll do it right now. Of course, sir. Yes, yes, you, you are the boss. The phone goes silent. The manager puts the receiver down on his desk. A few deep breaths are taken to calm his heart rate to see a head peer into the room. His assistant looks annoyed. Her boss is grimacing. He throws the jacket on his chair and takes the short walk around his desk. Then he starts to flick through his Rolodex. The assistant tuts. She walks out of the office, 
and starts to turn the lights back on. He can get his own freaking coffee this time, she mumbles. Fire, ravenous and creeping, cross trees, bushes and vines crackle and burn away as the flames engulf them. The brilliance of the blaze bleaches into the sky. Flickering embers tumble and dance in the warm updrafts, like fireflies rising up into the night sky. She awakens suddenly. The light stings her withered eyes. With partial sight, she recognizes the surroundings. All around her, the forest burns wildly, surrounding the old her up against the cliff that rises from the plains. The human creatures circle her, crowds of them. Watching closely with eyes that reflect the blaze, irises tinted with flickering orange. They snarl and bite at one another, teeth bared, ready to strike out at any beast that intrudes on their personal space. The old lady tries to rise to her feet. She stumbles and trips over. Cords bind her, her legs from ankle to knee. Her arms are bound too. Afraid and in pain, she slumps down into the grass. Hands move to her pockets, then to the pouch that hangs from her throat. She removes several items and tosses them onto the ground. A seed pod, a shell, various stones of all shapes and colours, and a bright red leaf. Her eyes widen, lips, the items have made a near-perfect circle with a red leaf landing right at its center. But they don't stay in that formation. The items start to shake as a low vibration surges from deep below. The old woman peers up at the cliff. Stones and shrapnel fall from high above, landing heavily at its base. A vast cave mouth fills her view. It seems unnaturally dark compared to the brilliance of the forest fire doesn't infiltrate the darkness within. The shuddering and vibration in the earth grows. The undead squawk and yelp, sniffing at the air like dogs. Which woman turns away from the cave? She clutches at the clumps of grass at her fingertips. The ground shakes more violently. A sound like nails clawing at a blackboard erupts from the cave mouth. The surrounding foliage bends to its force. More stones and pebbles tumble from the cliff face. The witch woman writhes in the dirt. Her body convulses. As she starts to scream, her eyes open wide. Beads of blood gather at their corners, then course down her face. Her screaming cuts through the tremendous base from the shifting earth. The floor moves effortlessly to and fro. Wild, frenzied villagers tear at the grass. Fingers ripping through the turf and topsoil. Hollow eyes blink the dirt from their disfigured faces. Amongst their crazed movements, the witch lies. She pours at her face, pulling at her hair, and rolls over onto her back. Fists pummel the ground. Her scream prevails, face wrought with agony. She stares up at the sky, but the stars have no answer for her. The gods are not smiling, it seems. She inhales leashes a howl. Hoarse and raw it is. The land ceases its convulsions. The trembling stops. Only reverberance of the base remains, fading quickly. Even the undead grow silent. They look cautiously at the elster, her face crimson, cheeks streaked with blood. Still she wails, Though now her anguish is tainted with anger, howling echoes around the forest, hanging in the air, seeking out the ear of all local fauna. Their heads twitch, insects squirm in the soil, and drop from the air. The undead around her contract, their lines force the woman to crawl nearer to the cave, but they tread lightly, never taking their eyes off of her bright, bold eyes that never blink, and they retreat. She moves closer to the cave, and they surge. One undead lunges in, attempting to nip at her fleshy thigh. The woman catches the thing's lower lip as it snaps. 
With both hands, she pulls the jaw hard downwards. A horseshoe-shaped puck of flesh and bone comes away in her fists. The braying creature fingers the hole in its face. It runs back to the ranks of to be engulfed by the mass of wild infected. Its pain squeals are quickly doused. Which woman coughs and spits out a lump of pink body matter. No more screaming comes from her. Just a low, husky inhalation. She stands. The cords that bind her fray. Splitting fully, then falling away. The undead with glazed eyes lower their heads in submission. The witch woman, now upright and rigid, steps out from her bindings. She turns to the undead, eyes shining red. <laughs>